Hello and welcome to another Retfer video. Here we have the NAD 3020A that we've been working on recently. Today I'm going to be showing the full process of changing all the electrolytic capacitors. So starting at this stage, the NAD 3020 has already been stripped down ready to have the capacitors changed. So if you do want to see the full strip down process, I'll put a link in the description for the other video which shows us stripping it down and repairing the controls on this. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to be showing the capacitor change and that's it, not the strip down process or the refit. Again, both of them are on the other video. So throughout this video, I'm not going to do a hell of a lot of talking about what's going on. I'm just going to let you sort of watch the, the process of how it's been done. Um, you'll see that it's the same process for each one. Obviously removing the original capacitor, using the solder and iron, using the solder removal tool, then fitting the new capacitor, soldering that back in, clipping off the legs, and that's about it. Obviously before any of this has started, I made sure that all the capacitors are safe. I've discharged them fully uh, using the appropriate procedure. And, you know, obviously I don't want to go in with a, with a capacitor which is fully charged. Um, obviously there's risk of shock and injury. So obviously that needs to be done beforehand before you go any further with, with actually removing capacitors. So this NAD 3020 I bought fairly recently. Um, it had a damage on the front panel, which again you'll see on the other videos. I've got a repair of the front panel and the control knobs were also damaged. So there's another video showing all of that. Uh, again, I'll put a link to both of these in the description just so you can see them. As you'll see in the other video, the system was sort of working, but it was temperamental because there was loose connections obviously with the control knobs. Once these were repaired, then the system was working okay. I decided to do the capacitor change purely just for a longevity sort of thing on the system. I wanted it to go on for future um, and also a lot of people said that the components that were used in the NAD, particularly the capacitors, were quite low quality. So I thought it was an ideal time while I've got it all stripped down that I can do all this. All the capacitors are going to be replaced with Nichicon. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. If I'm, if I'm wrong, someone do tell me. But um, yeah, all the capacitors are going to be high quality capacitors. I'm not putting any sort of unbranded, unknown capacitors in there. So again, on this project, I'm using my Milwaukee cordless soldering iron. Not the smallest of things, quite bulky to use sometimes, but for something like this, it's fine. You know, there's nothing that's that delicate. And to be fair, I've used it on delicate things and it's been okay. You can see from the video that I'm just still working through the capacitors, just going through each individual one, changing it, just taking my time on each one. Obviously the video has been sped up and a lot has been cut out just to save time. But each process has just been followed on each capacitor. I've done a bit of research recently about the NAD 3020 um, regarding startup process. So when you turn it on, you get probably about two or three seconds with no sound. Then you get like a whoop noise and then it will come on. So I know with the Sony that I use in my office, that one, when you turn it on, a similar thing. You get no sound. Then you hear the relay clicking and then it comes on. So I'm presuming it's something like that. Obviously it can't be a capacitor issue, they've all been changed. So it can't be that there's a capacitor which is faulty, which is causing it to take longer to warm up. But again, looking online and looking what I've read from other people, this is completely normal and people had this from new. So I'm presuming that this is the same as those. Obviously, if anyone does know any different, I'd be interested to see what people say, whether it is the same or if it's different. With this amplifier, I was initially going to replace the front panel, obviously because it was damaged when I got it. I was planning to get a machined metal front and then doing it that way, um, just to give it a bit of more of a, a nicer feel to the front of it instead of having the plastic panel like the NAD 3020s have. I know that the NAD systems were built to be cheaper um, while still giving out a good sound but it does sort of make it feel a little less sort of premium, if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, it, the repair did come out okay, and you'll see at the end of this video with the front panel that it looks all right. Um, I think it came out quite nice. Obviously not original, like I've said before in the other video, but I've done it as close as I can. The decals uh, had to be black because I couldn't print the white, but I think it gives it quite a nice look to it. So just moving away from the NAD 3020, I just thought I would mention some of the things that I've got coming up on future videos. I've got a Leak 30 stereo amplifier. I think it was between 1965 and 67. I think it was made. It's the transistor type radio. On that one, I've got some repairs to do on it. Obviously, you'll see that when the video comes out. I'm also looking at getting another Sony stereo from early sort of 60s, which is a tube type amplifier. I'm just trying to source an appropriate one at the moment. 
so that one will be coming up as well there's other non-stereo related videos that i've got i've got some more collectible stuff to put on there which i haven't done much of quite a few different bike related items coming up soon as well i'm also going to be looking at doing some more car related stuff um, i'm actually going to goodwood festival speed this year so i'm going to be getting a load of videos for the classic and retro stuff that's there basically any video that involves retro vintage collectible and any sort of refurbs along the way with those items as you can see from all my other videos i do enjoy doing this sort of thing enjoy doing refurbs so i thought it was ideal for this youtube channel to show all these processes that i do if anyone's got any comments um, any help any tips anything like that that can provide more information to the channel and people that follow it or look at the videos then that's great just add them in the comments so just going back to the video and the task in hand I'm just working my way through still the capacitors just taking it each one out obviously using the soldering iron and then using the sucker tool to suck the original solder out of the joint and then the capacitor can be removed fitting the new capacitor soldering it back in and clipping the legs off probably all in all total time to do this not including stripping and refitting probably a couple of hours um, off the top of my head I would say it was about that so not too bad time wise it's a fairly easy job to do as you can see don't need to rush whilst doing it i actually quite enjoy doing it to be honest it's um not too delicate that it sort of does your head in at times so it's yeah pretty straightforward there were a few capacitors that i bought that had short legs which did make it a little bit more trickier to solder in obviously when you've got the longer legs you can then solder it in and then snip them off but these shorter legs did prove to be a little bit too short at times, but they were okay. I just managed to come through the board enough. So that's something to look out for when buying capacitors. Obviously just look at the leg length. Tools wise on the job, there wasn't that many needed to be honest. Obviously to strip it down, you mainly need a Phillips head screwdriver. Um, then you can take most of the parts off and the front panel, you need a adjustable set of spanners or spanners of the correct size to remove the locking nuts around the knobs. Then once inside, soldering wise, obviously soldering iron, something to remove the solder from the board, um, sucker, or you can use the wick which uh, absorbs the solder as you do it. A set of side cutters to cut the legs off the capacitors. Solder, preferably flux cord, which will just make it easier for you. If not, then you will need flux to go with it. And that's mainly about it. Obviously, you've got to have something which discharges the capacitors before removing them. So you will need some sort of tool to do this and also a multimeter just to check that they have been discharged successfully. I never do the method of just bridging them with a screwdriver. I don't trust it. I think it could be potentially a bit dangerous, so I always discharge them properly. So going back to other videos that are going to be on the channel, if anyone's got any sort of recommendations for videos or systems they'd like to see worked on or reviewed or anything like that, um, any sort of amplifiers, anything which maybe of interest to anyone then please do leave a comment then I can look into it and see if I can find something suitable obviously I will be posting lots of different amplifiers and audio equipment as we go on but anything which anyone can recommend that might be interesting to do please do let me know the next audio equipment that I will be working on is a leak stereo 30 amplifier that I've already mentioned earlier in this video that's the next one to work on so that will be coming soon on a future video I've got another gaming related video which will be uploaded next but after that it should be the leak 30 so as you can see on the video I'm currently working on the four main capacitors on the amplifier these ones obviously discharged before doing this so these ones a little bit more solder to suck off so they take a little bit more time to do you can see the difference in the size of the old ones compared to the new ones when I come to fitting them in. Um, so even though they're the same power, the actual size of the capacitor is a hell of a lot of difference now on these newer modern ones. So this is the first time I've worked on a non-Sony amplifier. 
um, to this depth. I've had other like techniques in Kenwood, but I've never done this sort of work on it. It's mainly been Sony. Um, as I've said before in other videos, Sony is the brand that I like to use. Uh, I always think it sounds good, it always seems to be well built. I know there's a lot of different opinions on that and I'm sure there's other systems which probably are a lot higher end but to the normal person I find them pretty good to be fair. Uh, no issues with them, obviously some better than others admittedly. Uh, I've had a couple of recently which not quite as good sounding. The one that I use every day which is in my office, that one's the TAV710 which is a pretty good amplifier, you know, it's, it sounds good. It's a bit more modern than the one that I've got downstairs, which is a TA1150. But I personally do like all the Sony units. Um, I'd be interested to see what other people think and what other people use a lot and what they swear by. But with regards to this amplifier, I was quite interested to get one to see what it'd be like, see what it'd be like to work on also. I know there's a lot of people that love these amps and they get a lot of good reviews, especially when you look back at top amplifiers of all time by sort of period, uh, the NAD. 3020 seems to be always in there, no matter who reviews it. There are a couple of amps I would actually like to keep in my personal collection. If anyone knows of one for sale, uh, one of them is a Sony TA1120 amplifier, which if I'm right and same was the first transistor amplifier that Sony made. So that would be nice to have. Um, even a TA1130, TA1140 either of them would be nice also. I've got a TA1150 that I keep saying, um, which I love. It's my favourite amp. I think it's the nicest sounding amp that I've had. Um, interesting to see how this NAD sounds when it's all done. But yeah, the TA1120 would be nice. Also, I have been looking at the Sony SRA2, which is a tube amplifier, which I think is a preamp if I'm right. If someone does know, please let me know also on the comments. Um, so that would be also quite interesting to maybe work on in refurb. I do like the look of some of the old Technic stuff, especially some of the 80s stuff. I do quite like the sort of plain black finishes that a lot of them had on there. I know it probably sounds a bit boring, but I do quite like that sort of boxy look. But yeah, uh, I do like the Technic stuff as well. Not necessarily as a system that I would keep and use all the time, but I'd be probably quite interested to work on it. Also, I do quite like the ghetto blasters that Sony made, the FH range, I've had a couple of them now, FH55 and FH7, um, both of them pretty good systems, sounded pretty good, but I didn't end up keeping them. Now moving back to this amplifier, cost-wise, the amplifier I think cost me £60, um, obviously with the fault. The guy said that it was working but it, it had problems with the controls. I do question the fact that he said it was working because yes, I suppose it was to a fashion but it, every time you sort of press the buttons as you saw when I demoed it at the beginning, it wasn't really working that great. You couldn't sort of just leave it on and just live with it. It needed to be rectified. So yeah, that was taken into account. So I think it was 60 or 70 pound, I think maximum I paid for it. And with regard to the capacitors, I bought them actually all off of eBay sellers. It worked out cheaper doing it that way. Pretty much from, I think it was two sellers that I bought individually and when you had combined discounts, buying multiple items, it worked out actually cheaper than buying it from the other supplier that I've used before, which is on a website, I can't remember their name. They're quite a popular place that a lot of people go to for this sort of electrical equipment. Both the sellers shipped them out really quick. One of them did send um, one item wrong but as it turned out it was okay it could be used still in place for the two that I had to replace so that was absolutely fine they were the correct ratings. Um, I think the voltage on the capacitors that he'd sent were slightly higher so there was no issue with that. 
Uh, and I think in total the capacitors were about £45 if I remember rightly. So yeah, all in all it's about 100 and I don't know if it was 60 quid, it'd be 105, 70 quid, obviously 115 pound in total to do it. Um, and then obviously I had to repair the front panel with the switches when I did that on the other video. So I had to buy some conductive paint for that. But obviously the bottle were gone for ages. You literally use a tiny amount when I did the repair on the uh, switches. So yeah, that'll keep in the toolbox. Um, I think that was about seven quid that, 7.99, something like that on Amazon. But I probably used like half a penny's worth of it. Um, so I don't really put that into the cost, to be honest. Other than that, bit of paint on the front. And obviously I made the decals up to go on the front panel when I did that, also on another video. So again, cost-wise for that, wouldn't have been a hell of a lot. I didn't use a hell of a lot of paint, even if you said tenner. Um, so all in all, uh, I've not really spent any more than £130 doing it. So to buy a NAD amplifier like this, which has probably been fully recapped um, and in reasonable condition, you would probably pay more than that anyway, I would have thought, um, looking at some of the prices. Uh, obviously the front panel's not 100% original, like I've said many times, but it still does look good, tidies it up, it looks better than the damaged original anyway, which I would rather have. So yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do with this amplifier yet, I may keep it, I may use it um, in another room, I'm not sure, I might just sell it, I, I don't know, but I do... I do think that it's going to be like a nice looking amplifier wherever I do put it. Again, it's got a sort of stealthy look with the black decals on the gloss grey, which I do quite like. When it comes to any sort of equipment really, I always think that it's always worth trying to repair it if possible. Um, I know quite a few people, you know, if you've got a cheap system, something which is like an all-in-one system that might not be worth that much. Um, I've seen people on forums and groups um, that when someone shares a picture saying, oh, there's a fault with it, and you get people saying, oh, what's the point? You know, it's rubbish, just throw it away, not worth spending the time on it. Which, yeah, all right, I get the fact that some things are not worth as much, but if something hasn't cost you anything, if it's something you've had for a while, hasn't cost you anything, or someone's given it for free, then why not have a look, see if it's easily repairable? Because quite often than not, it could be a nice, easy repair. It could be something really simple. Um, like a Sony FH5, I think it was, that I had at the time. And that sounded absolutely awful. Every time you tried to do the knobs or anything, it just just hardly any sound coming out of one side. The other side was real crackly. Um, and you know all it was was just dirty controls that was it so anyone that sort of turned around and says it's not worth doing it I know with that it's worth more money so it's worth investigating it a bit more but anyone that says that a system is just not worth it then why not just try some of the simple things first if not then all well and good or if you don't want to waste the time then don't do it um, obviously you need the knowledge to do it uh, first before you do get into doing the stuff but I always think it's worth trying to save things better than it going in landfill and just then buying another one to replace it which quite often not will probably be worse so yeah why not try and repair stuff I just think with modern day items people were far too quick to chuck things out and not attempt to have them repaired I know some stuff is probably cheaper to have replaced rather than take it to someone to be repaired but if you've got the skills that you can look into things a bit more and do it safely then yeah, th then there's no reason why we shouldn't do it really and then preserve some of the stuff rather than just chucking it all away. And this is even more true for older vintage and retro items that we want to keep going um, and preserve some of that sort of older nostalgic stuff. So now back to the video and the repair that we're doing here. We're getting close to finishing, changing all the capacitors round. Um, just working our way through just the same on each one as we did at the beginning. Um, so yeah, this, like I said earlier, this one's been quite an easy one to do. The board's been quite easy to work on. 
Um, and yeah, it'll be a nice little repair when it's finished. Here I'm just fixing the switch back on the rear panel, which I had to remove to get some of the capacitors out. So now we're coming to the end of doing the capacitor change and we can look at then getting it tested and showing it working. So now that it's all back together, we can plug it all in and give it a quick demo check. So that's it all done capacitors changed all tested everything working fine so yeah nice repair there i can't obviously compare it to what it sounded like previously because i couldn't test it due to the damage that it had on it but yeah i'm happy with how it's come out thanks for taking the time to watch the video it's really appreciated please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one